Welcome to the Vantage Points video series episode 2. My name is Rohama Ifere and I am the host for the Vantage Points video series. Of course, I will not be alone. Um, I have my guest Florence Nene Ugu who will be joining in shortly and then we can proceed without much ado. Hopefully Instagram grants us this access. All right, um, Florence, I can see you. I'll send an invite in the Instagram live. Have you seen my invite? Can you see my invite to join um, the Instagram? I do, not, I do not know what's going on. Trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know how to navigate this, but this same thing occurred last week. I was unable to accept my guests and I had to join has like they keep saying you are not able to join which i find strange okay flores can you go live on your own end and i just join you why i figure out what's going on exactly okay. <laughs> oh my god hi hi, hi. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> At some point, I was wondering that you know, should I bring the live go to Instagram or what exactly do they want from me? <laughs> oh my God, let me share this like a bit so that we can get. Yeah, I think the light, the rays from the sun is mm. from. Okay, I think it's a, a bit okay now, right? Yeah, a bit okay. Maybe you have to bring down the you have to bring down the curtains to cover the lake. Yeah, much better. Okay. All right, Florence, so good to see you. Welcome to Vantage Point Video Series, Episode 2. <laughs> you look lovely. Thank you. How is love? I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So I was asking, I said, how is law school? Uh, law school is fine. We, um, how do you say it? We're on um, what court attachment extension right now. So mm -hmm. I'm back to the house. I go to the courts Monday to Friday, observing, taking notes. You know, now we are doing what we call uh, the practical of the theory we've been learning since. Yeah. Excellent. I know it's an amazing experience. Okay, yeah. um, for our viewers who have joined us, thank you so much for joining in on time and we'll just begin. My name is Rohama Ifere. I am the founder of the Youth Evolve, a non-governmental organization that advocates for young people's inclusion in peace building processes and gender equality. And um, I am the host of the Vantage Point video series. We started out last week, and today is the second episode of this Vantage Point series. Of course, as you can see, I am not alone. I have my very special guest, Florence Nene Ugu. And I am not going to read her profile. But I, when I saw her profile, I was like, no, I won't read her profile. I'm going to give Florence that avenue to introduce herself to us. So Florence, please introduce yourself to us. Tell us who you are. Ah, okay, so <laughs> uh, there is nothing much about Florence, really. When people tell me um introduce myself, it's really a very difficult thing for me to do because honestly, aside the whole, my name is Florence Nene Ugo, and um, 
a let's say law student in view and an alumni of the u.s exchange program here in nigeria everything i do is from my heart from my passion i don't really call it so much important but then in a nutshell i'm an education campaign personnel i advocate for quality education in the space especially in the rural places i'm a gender activist i'm a youth inclusion personnel in terms of i have sat on different panels of policy making for ease of doing business for the youth for the inclusion of youth in government and that's how far i could say i've come absolutely well i i know i know for it for, for a fact that you are you are that and a whole lot more i mean i i met you remember when i met you um when we were going to accra when we were selected as yali rfp um fellows and of course i could see your passion for you know leadership and you've shared so much stories of how you've joined meetings at midnight with regards to you know politics and elections and i'm like wow it takes someone who's very determined to be able to sacrifice that much um for the betterment of young people in your states and i, I would say you're doing so great um so this topic is gender equality in education all right and of course again here in nigeria for those of us that may not know we are joining in from nigeria here in nigeria it's also a democracy day right it's the new democracy day june 12th ruby share with us what does advocacy mean to you i know you're saying it doesn't mean a lot but it means a lot to the people that you have helped to you know empower the people that you have helped to make their lives better through the policies through the sponsorships and the rest what does advocacy mean to you can you share your journey into the gender equality space how did it all began i'm sure that there was a particular day you said to yourself i want to be this i want to be known for this i want to help people okay so my journey basically in advocacy started 26 2015 2016 and it was more like um I, was, I went to a certain um, community, just a Christian okay. outreach, actually. And it was on a school day, but the amount of children that were moving around was alarming, right? So I, I just asked a random question, is there no school in this community? And they said the school in the community is far. So most times they don't allow children of a certain age go to school. They have to wait till they are up between seven to eight years to go to school and in my head i'm like seven eight years i'm already when i was seven years eight years I, if i'm not mistaken i was already in primary three or four so that means this child you know three four five six four years of her life or his life the child has just been there doing nothing so it's kind of arose a lot of question in me and that was the first time i ever had myself go to meet people to talk about what if you just put a shed what if you just get graduates from your community what if if you just have a sister or the reverend father speak to the decision secretary to send somebody to come and tutor these kids in what we call nursery school or kindergarten why they migrates to wherever this other community the school is that was yeah. the first advocacy i ever heard right and i remember the reverend father i met in that community still keeps in touch with me till today not that he hasn't thought about it before but seeing me talk about it and helping me put the letters together to send to the diocesan and everything i wasn't even bothered about putting my name there or anything because the community is not even where i'm from so i knew i wouldn't be able to be coming there but they could do something it's a catholic church we have reverend fathers or reverend sisters who we know are lecturers in the university teachers in our secondary school so all it would take the catholic church to do is to send somebody there and i'm glad they did they saw reasons and they did and that was how they started nursery school which was the first thing they started in the community and today there is a primary school day the community had already had a secondary school before so there's a primary school there even though according to them 
there was a primary school by the government but you know government things so it didn't really match up the the building was dilapidated and everything but this is my journey into advocacy so i found out that if you can if somebody can't speak you can actually speak for the person mm. if somebody can't write, you can actually write for the person you don't necessarily have to be the face there but you can help the person start that movement you can help the person bring um, um what would we call a benefit to their community right mm. you can help the person bring the government that's how i see it close that to them Mm. I think I think this is very apt and I must really applaud you for this because this closing statement that you just mentioned is very important here and I'm going to like emphasize it for those that may have not heard it. You said if somebody can't speak, be the voice for them. Somebody can't write, you know, write for them. And I think that's very fantastic. That really explains what advocacy really is. Because there are some people that are voiceless, right? They're going through a lot. In the sense of you don't have access to education in the sense of gender inequality in the sense of war and they can't speak for themselves but you are not in that um you're not going through that but you can speak which is why i know i invited you for this particular reason because i would want you later on to shed you know, more light on how people can go into advocacy so when we hear advocacy activism is beginning to sound like a very um Difficult tax, like you know, you have to be someone that is very passionate about speaking, you have to be someone that is very passionate about talking and you know, being in the limelight. But I know that there are some people that are not necessarily in the limelight, but they are really creating change and you know, lasting impacts in their society. Um, I read your profile earlier that you sent to me, and you know, you mentioned that you have a foundation which is called the Igwe Foundation. and I saw that you've also sponsored, you know, over 30, over 30 children, if I'm not mistaken, you know, young girls to school. And I know that it has not been rosy. You shared one example for us of one that really worked. That's fine. But I know in our advocacy space, it's not so rosy. I mean, you, there are some bottlenecks that you have to face. So please share with us, Igwe Foundation, from when you created it to now, what have been those bottlenecks that you have faced? How has it been? Or is the government supporting you? In this year, advocacy, please share with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, so EBA stands for Initiative for Girls and Women Enlightenment. EBA was supposed to be just a program I wanted to run with young mothers in rural community. Um, EBA was born on May 27, 2019. Right? Yeah. 2019 okay. and it was born out of need too so this, this was i visited a government hospital for some reason i'm not going to call name um and i went to the children's ward to see i actually went there to see someone okay. somebody invited me so i looked around i was like this is a children's Children's world for crying out loud. There's nothing enticing here. It's all looking blank and sick, you know, which it really didn't go with me. I don't like hospital. I don't like injection. So for a child who doesn't like hospital and doesn't like injection, that's a lot of a scary environment, right? So, and the young mother I went to see, she's about... 19 years and she was already married she she was pregnant um but the child was breached and because they live in a rural community it took a while before they brought her to the government hospital in town which resulted to other medical issues so somebody called my attention and I came, I saw the lady, and I reached out to people for help to do the necessary surgery that was needed for her. And I'm glad the baby was alive, but she had some medical issues that didn't need to be delayed. It needed to be taken care of. So in that okay. process, that was what better gave me. She's a handicapped young lady. She wasn't doing much, depending on the husband, whatever the husband was doing at that time. And 
that was when I bettered Igwe. It was an enlightenment uh, program. We, we uh, engaged with these ladies, young ladies in the rural community. We spoke to them both on their financial life, emotional life, economic life, and we taught them some skills. So after the program ended, my teammates, them, they, they were like, why don't we you know, establish this? Why do we have to close down after this program? I was like, if there's anything else I'm going to do with this, it's going to be to renovate the children's world. They said, then renovate it. I thought it was a joke, and we gathered storybooks, toys, bought some toiletries. We had to, because it was a team of young people, both men and women, we produced the details and the liquid soap we submitted to the children's world ourselves. And we took it there. I, I have a picture of it, I think it's on my page you know and we took it there and we submitted it I'm, I'm glad even after years i went there early this year i went back to that government hospital early this year and i saw some of the toys and some of the storybook yeah it might not be in the condition but i'm glad they understood it now they have a lot of paintings there they have uh drawings of you know mickey mouse and snow white and whatever thing you know children love put on those walls so now it's more like for me this is more you know calming more suiting it's not going to be just messing and you know a scary environment for the child the child is going to come and point out to a very funny cartoon that the child has watched somewhere oh mommy it's Mickey Mouse oh mommy it's this Snow White and that and that so that's basically what gutted Igwe and that was how Igwe came to be as an organization and since 2019 till date we have ventured into a lot of things we branched out and it was through Igwe that was able to train the 30 girls i trained we had 20 from primary school move to the university um, to the secondary school and we trained 10 young girls from secondary school to senior secondary school and we've had about five people that we paid for their work and they graduated amazing like amazing testimonial so far that you shared you know in, in all the stories and all your journey you just keep showing that you have always loved to be the voice for the voiceless and i'm going to re-emphasize what you said about you know being the voice for those that cannot speak write things for those that cannot write um but ruby again i want to um get clarity on this part all these things that you've done so far have they just been your own funding like from your pockets your personal pockets i mean every time you see any situation where you know children are not in school girls are not you know having that access to quality education to good health and well-being and all of those things you're bringing money from your pockets how have you been able to do all of this and like i said it just can't be so rosy because i mean we're all in the advocacy space there are some bottlenecks that you might have paid so for instance when you went to the um to the um hospitals i mean did they just welcome you like that with open hand that's great but i want to know how you navigate through all of these because advocacy is about navigating through these bottlenecks and i really want to diplomacy is about you know communication is about empathy you know you have to also try to be in the other person's side of truth while you're speaking so sometimes you know what you're pushing for is the right thing to do but you also have to especially when it's in the government space you also have to be concerned about the other end of the party who is receiving you know the the the, the voice of what you're talking about because they might understand you yes but because of the system in which they belong to change takes process mm. can be done immediately it's a process right and you have to give the person like a quick tap all the time i'm waiting on you where are we how far have we come where do you want me now? Do you want me to step in? Do we need to come together to join forces? Synergy, right? It's mm -hmm. always a you don't push because mm -hmm. it's a system. 
I agree. Okay. We always say give and take, give and take, and we keep doing it like that, so we sort everything out. So I'm not going to say it's all rosy in advocacy. Hell no. There are MDAs you will write to, and for three, four, six months, they have not replied that letter. And you can't go to someone's office when your letter hasn't been responded to, an appointment date has not been given to you. That would be, you know, entering somebody's space, which is not good. I remember when the 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 uh, commissioner for education of a of a certain state said he doesn't want CSOs visiting schools and taking pictures anymore. Why? If you go through my Twitter my Twitter handle, everything about education from 2019 till date, I still go to school. I still go to snap pictures and ask government. You said you renovated school. You said you built school. You went to build a new set of lockers. When we have this, this block of classrooms that could be renovated and, you know, you will equip it with the necessary materials that is needed to make a school more engaging. So why are you building another set of local schools? Because these are the kind of thing we need to engage our government with. Mm. And be, believe you me, there are times people will enter my DM and say, you think you're educated, you are, you are that, you are this, you are that. So we even delete your post or even report you and they will block your account for no just reason. In, in December in December 13, 2020, 2020, I started an advocacy in August of that year leading to the pensions of teachers in Enugu State. It wasn't an easy thing. I'm glad I always have the gift of men to work with. If you're yeah. someone you you're always on my status that you have my personal number. You see me most times, I just come out and say, Lord, I thank you for the gift of men because the things I do, I can't do them alone. And I remember young men and women, they joined me and we took turns to go to the pension board and sit down with teachers on verification days to ask them questions because I needed to know what I'm coming up against, right? Mm -hmm. I already know I've engaged some teachers because I had aunties that were teachers too and they were retired. And one told me since 2019 she retired till date. 2018 she retired till date. She hasn't gotten one of her. Not even one pension was paid to her. And I'm like, that's two years. So what happened? Why have you been paid? And a lot of stories. So I had to go to the pension board. And we began to take turns. We began to ask people. And those retired teachers come as far as Ubulako, Mako. These are communities in it that made up Enugu State. And they will come and do verification and they will go and nothing is paid. So that December, I said, okay, we've gotten enough evidence. So we began to pay them a visit in their office. We came the first time. Time, the second time we didn't meet anybody the third time i said you are invited for a radio program please come i i was able to send the numbers of the stakeholders in the mda the commission the pension board to the radio person that was inviting us for the radio engagement they called the necessary person they promised to come and they did not come you know the funny thing the radio station gave me 45 minutes Three slots, but while I was on air speaking, because I, I I went alone with the chairman of pension union of teachers and some retired teachers as well. And as we were speaking, somebody said, "Please, what would it cost you to extend this documentation to the next forty-five minutes?" And the the radio interview guy said, "Call so 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 line and take it off from there." Somebody called immediately and paid for another slot. Amazing. Because the truth is, these people 
they might understand what is happening, but it's having the time to speak, having the time to engage. Funny enough, a week plus after we had that radio engagement, they paid more than 1,000 teachers that December. Hmm. Is that not a positive outcome to an advocacy? Mm -hmm. It's always a bottleneck. The time I used in going to the to the pension board, the time I used, I used in sitting down with these retired teachers and engaging them, that's a lot. That's a bottleneck going out of my way because that's not the only thing I do, but mm -hmm. something needed to be done. And I needed to inconvenience myself to get it done. Mm. And I agree. Tell me, you know, I, I know when I have to call friends to beg. I remember, I think 2020, after the COVID, around October, November, I wrote to some of my friends. I said, if I can get one 1,000 Naira from you people, I think about 50 of them, that it would help me put back some of my students in school. And I was not working as of 2020 because I think I just finished having them. And one of them called me and said, 1,000, what will you do, Nene? I said, 1,000, I want to know what 1,000 I do. He said, it will buy two, two um, rows of tissue, which is what was needed to go to the primary school then, mm -hmm. two toilet rolls, and a broom, and some pieces of chalk. And these things are still, are still a bit affordable there. No, to tell you how much I got involved with primary school, like you wake me up and I tell you what a child needs to go to primary school outside the test book and the exercise book and the school uniform. Mm. You, you know? Uh, and the guy was, was like, okay, fine. Send me your account number. I'm going to take 10 children. So that year, my target was to put at least 40 children back to school. I already have been piling up exercise book for a while, so I had almost 500 pieces of exercise book. So all I needed was to buy some school sandals, so the toilet paper, the brooms, and the packet of chalk. And I did it. We took them back to school. And that was just after the COVID. And we knew how COVID affected a lot of daily income earners, the artisans. And I was glad that these children in the rural area didn't have to stop school. They went back to school. It's always an inconvenience. It's always a bottleneck somewhere. But the truth is, if you see the smile on the face, you see the result it brings. It makes you understand that there is a need, there is a gap. So you can only do the best you can to keep going. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Ruby. Your, your... Your advocacy journey is actually very beautiful. I mean, the way you keep showing up for these children, the way you keep showing up for teachers, the way you keep advocating in the education space. Trust me, I see it. I see it in the United States and I'm like, you're doing so well. You're doing so well in that regard because I know how there's usually a lot of pushbacks and it's not like we have much time on our hands. But regardless of it all, you just somehow just find a way to navigate and, you know, overcome all these obstacles so we're going to do something if you are a minister of education today what are the three things or three policies or three you know laws that you're going to introduce for there to be like a radical change in education because you know sometimes it's very easy for us to see the flaws of people from outside you know if you're outside this is observe and be like that person should have done it this way person should have done it this way but just imagine that you are giving that peace today right now this democracy day and they're saying nene you're now the new minister of education what will you do differently okay so funny i have thought about this like i keep yes. telling myself you are if you're in the a space where you're always advocating for what difference would you make and the truth is it boils down to our policies what policies are in place in this mdas mm. Funny enough, rama you and i had a better education than what we have now upon the whole 
um, American curriculum, British that, American whatever, whatever, they are all merging now. The truth is, I look back and I see that the, the time I spent in my primary school is actually what is helping me now. Those days mm -hmm. that we map out for musical learning, where you have to go and learn how to play the xylophone or the piano or the band, those days we still do handwork in schools where you have to learn how to make um, small, small, unnecessary ornaments with, you know, a mud. That's a pottery, pottery work. Mm -hmm. Those PE. Now, the primary school people emphasize so much on physical education that it becomes as if it's an inter-house sports for the secondary school. If primary school is supposed to be fun and engaging and not a competition that mm. much, which is what I had. I don't know what someone else had, but I remember Wednesday PEs were exciting days and it was in the morning or mid-afternoon. Then the school closes for the day. You know, Fridays were moral classes and musical instrument lessons. So, First of all, we have to go back to the policies. Where did we go wrong with these policies? Mm -hmm. Now, what are the level of um, practice the teachers we turn out have? We used to have teachers training school one and two and three, TTC. Okay. How did we travel that out of the curriculum? Because that teaching practice is a very, very, very engaging part of teaching that, that's why me and you still see our primary school teachers we remember them we greet them because they didn't just teach you they were engaging to your emotional being too a teacher knows when to plug a child for failing and a test or anything and when to call the child to say what happened are you not paying attention did i not teach you well so the policies most of this MDA, especially in the education, um, in the Ministry of Education, it has to do with the policy. The, the federal policies are there, but what happens? How intimate and how engaging is the state policy? The person that is the ministry, the commissioner for education, the person that is the permanent secretary of education was education. Um, was education their first option of subjects? Their career-wise, how much have they been involved in education? I know sometimes people, like you, you wouldn't say, oh, because this person read education in school, they are going to be amazing in it, I get. But yeah. when it comes to education, because this is, how will I say, this is the moral bed for the community, for the country. Education is the moral bed for the country because what you teach these children in school is what they come out to the community, to the country, to exhibit. Is the person there invested in having not just halfway policy, but the full way implementation of this policy? So I would go back to, you know, calling for a round table dialogue to look at the policies of education, guiding the Ministry of Education. I will look at the teachers' welfare scheme. Okay. These people are doing a lot of work. Primary school is, is, is a, a three-phase life of a child. It is the life of learning and listening. These children, they see very well they hear very well. So if the teacher is not paying attention, they will learn the wrong thing and see the wrong thing. It is also the formative life. Most times, when a child has passed the age of the primary school, if the child does not pick up the right manners at that primary level, you, there is nothing you could do at secondary level. Because at secondary level, they are dealing with peer pressure. They are dealing with teenage exuberance. They are dealing with a lot of things. 
So you've lost them. All you owe them at the secondary level of life is prayers. So that by the time they get to the tertiary stage of life, they begin to go back to the manner as that was taught to them at primary level. They begin yeah. to go to those teachings, those things they saw you do as a teacher, as a mother. So if you've missed a child's formative stage, this three phase of life, you've missed it. So it's important that we invest in our teachers. Teachers' welfare school, you should look at it very well. So that they will have the time to also invest in our children because they are the ones we will meet in the society. And then we, sh we should also look at the educational curriculum. In, in the past five years, a lot of things has been tossed forward and backward and forward and backward from removing mm. Christian religious knowledge to adding it back as Christian religious studies from removing the history to adding it back from you know a lot of things first of all before you change curriculum like this in in our nation in a nation like nigeria or in a country like nigeria you have to look at the people you're dealing with we are a very cultural indigenous people i don't think our history should be removed from us we need to learn them as it is, to learn to tell our stories, to learn to tell our pains, our failures. That's what history is all about. And then you learn to, to um, how would I put it? You learn to also not make the mistakes of the past. So, for me, these are the things I'll be looking at. The curriculum the teachers welfare scheme and the policy you know that is available in that mda as a commissioner for education or as the honorable minister for education thank you so much um ruby well said i mean i like the way you actually buttressed your point so you didn't just list it out for us but you told us how you know looking at the welfare of teachers can actually help the teachers or motivate them to do more um introducing back the teachers training you call it ttc i think that ttc when last i heard that ttc I, I don't know if it was during my time but when last i heard that ttc it was during my grandmother's time <laughs> so my grandmother was a teacher my maternal grandmother <laughs> was a teacher actually oh, yeah really? and um, my maternal grandfather was like the first headmaster in that place so i i used to hear them when they discuss that ttc something that's like the last time i heard about that thing so i've not heard it in recent time but i know the amazing um contributions or that impact that had on you know teachers and how it also flows down to the children um ruby in closing i know some people that have joined us from the beginning um and even those that are joining in now we'll be wondering uh, what are we discussing we're discussing education and we're discussing um you know gender equality how we can promote children's rights to assessing quality education and ruby here with me is not just an expert but one that is very passionate about advocacy she has shared her journey she has talked about her foundation the igwe foundation and you know the bottlenecks she faced and how she has navigated them so very quickly ruby is now going to share with us in closing how to begin your steps in advocacy um you know in the beginning i said some people see advocacy as a very very heavy step to you know embark on a heavy journey they wonder how they can go on it we want non googleable experiences now judging from all that you shared so far so somebody just comes in and i'm like oh i'm interested i want to begin advocacy how do i start do i have to have my own foundation i get that question a lot do i have to have my own foundation do i have to have my own initiative am i going to register my own ngo those kind of questions please share with us do we have to have our own ngos do we have to you know start our own foundations like Igwe foundation <laughs> and then you know just before you speak i heard you say something that you know in 2019 if i heard you correctly i think you said in march that you started at Igwe foundation so that would was that what in me May. was that when you came back from the yali arc because trust me that 2019 i we bettered a lot 
like those of us that went to RLC, Accra, Ghana, and came back. You see, 2019, we bettered a lot. Used to be more 2019. But let's just connect 2019. A lot of things I can mention was 2019. So yeah. please tell me about that and then tell me how, or share with us how we can, you know, start this step. Well, um, um, the, the, the program has been in pipeline, but there was no name yet. It was after I came back from RLC Accra that, um, you know, it kind of made all sense. I remember the name was just for the program. I didn't want to start an initiative. It was mm. just for that program. I wanted to run with young mothers in rural uh, communities to engage them more, you know, give them some training on human capital development and some skill acquisition as well. Then fast forward to where we are today. Now, uh, you don't need your own NGO or initiative or foundation to be an advocate. Advocacy is more of you speaking up, seeing a gap, and then asking questions, what needs to be done, right? Um, I, I, Rama, it was in 2019 we met, right? And yeah. before then, there was no youth evolved. There was no volunteer connect. Yeah. We were just passionate young people, giving our time to the yearly body, right? And mm -hmm. also branching out in different other organizations. Aside, before then, I have worked with different organizations as a volunteer, as an intern, as a state rep. I didn't need my own NGO or my initiative to do this thing. We just need to identify a need and speak up about it. As you go on, your, your passion or your ideas or your love could change. You could cover an inch, niche for yourself. But the truth is, advocacy is about speaking up for the greater good. It's about identifying a societal need and then speaking up about it. And not just speaking, but engaging the necessary body about it. So if it's an issue that has to do with government, you have to look out for the MDA that is responsible. If it's an issue that has to do with, I'm, I'm branching out big time for the past two years now, I've been, you know, very stated in the gender uh, space. Speaking of against brave, against domestic violence, against child abuse, against trafficking. So yes, I've engaged with the Ministry of Gender a lot. I've engaged with a lot of women organizations. I've engaged with some media people to get free slots to speak on this issue. Because this is a space I am working in and it needs all the attention it can get. Am I still in the education space? Yes. Am I still in the government space? Because I am a youth and I'm interested in the politics of this nation because you cannot keep yourself away from the rules that make the rules. That's what I call politics. Mm. It's the rule that makes the rule. Mm. You have to be engaging as a, a young person. 2023, from May to August, I ran a 12 weeks campaign on PBC. Nobody paid me for it. In fact, it was when I started that people started sending me money to enable me go to as far as Nkano East, Enugu North, Enugu South, and all that because I was the main in Enugu and that was where I was working. When I began to engage INEC as an individual, I didn't use Igwe just as an individual. Yes. Wow. And I began to bring INEC officials to churches on Sundays to register people. Because I know there is need for every person that is of age to vote in Nigeria to be committed. It is a civil right. It is your entitlement. 
and it's a franchise I believe we need to, you know, perform. That was my idea. And for mm. 12 weeks, I shot between all these places and my job at that time because I was also working. In fact, I remember I fell out with my principal at some point. I just had to plead with her, I, you know, like that. So you really do not need an NGO or an initiative or to open your own NGO. In fact, please find NGOs. Look at Rama. Ask her how you can come in and help because I know she would need you to take some things off her place. Mm -hmm. Engage. You don't even, you, in fact, you can join her in what she's doing right now and build a niche for yourself. That's the truth. You don't need to go open your own. You don't need to go registering. There's a lot of registered NGO. A lot. Some of them don't even know what, what to do. You know, after they have done the first program. Be good as a program manager. Be good as a project uh, uh, supervisor. Be good as a project incubator. That means you have project ideas flowing through your head 24-7. So you don't really need to find something you're passionate about. The sustainable development goal is 17 in number. I like the 17th part. With everything I do, I am so interested in number 17, which is collaboration and partnership. Yeah. Find what you can do and highness on that. That's how mm -hmm. I see it. That's how I started. And that's why I am here today. Thank you, Ruby. Five words, what you can do, how you can, you know, join an initiative, an organization, volunteer with them, partner with them, and you know, just keep creating impact. Thank you so much, Ruby, for um, really taking time out of your busy schedule to get me like on Instagram. I do not take it for granted. Um, for those that may just be joining in again, this is Vantage Points video series, episode two. And of course, as you can see, I have my very guest florence nene Igwe, who has shared so much on our advocacy journey um of course the link will be reposted here for those that you know were not here from the beginning to also watch um i've not seen any questions so far but i've seen comments and i thank you so much for the explanation so in thank the absence you. of no further question ruby this is me saying thank you for joining me live and thank you for sharing with us your journey uh, I am really looking forward to, you know, hearing more about your great exploits and um, your advocacy, even as you get caught back, because definitely you get caught back. So we're looking forward you to man. more of your advocacy <laughs> in that space also. Well done, Ruby. And thank you to our participants for joining us. Um, same time next week, Wednesday at 3 p.m., we'll come again to discuss another topic with another guest on Vantage Point video series. Thank you so much and bye. Bye, Ruby. Bye. Bye.